talk about what deferred work is. And thank you, audience, for your participation. So uh, deferred work comes basically in two categories. There is work that was running or could run but doesn't because of resource unavailability. And the resource that is lacking could be a lock, a buffer, a message. Um, and so that work is waiting. Then there's work that is newly needed in response to an event. And this work is typically run by a function called a callback. And so just to make more concrete what I'm talking about, here is a seasonally appropriate example. You, your accountant might say, upload your tax documents. But rather than do that now, if you're in an uninterruptible fund state, you might enqueue the work function on a list to be performed later. So this is an example of deferred work. And of course, deferred work is not unique or invented by the Linux kernel. It's an old pattern in software engineering and used by all kinds of programs. So let's turn to the kinds of deferred work that are important for the Linux kernel. So for the purpose of this talk, there are two major uh, performers of deferred work. There are soft IRQs, so-called because they follow on, are the bottom halves in the parlance of hard IRQs, which are actual uh, interrupts. And then there are key workers, which are executor of work which has been placed on work queues. And so the first half of the talk will describe soft IRQs, which are a, a legacy mechanism uh, added in 1992 to the kernel. Uh, the file softirq.c actually has Linus's own copyright at the top. And then uh, key workers, which also are a very old feature of the kernel, but are uh, more flexible and newer. And so why would you care about deferred work at all? Why would you ever think about it? Well, the answer is sometimes it uh, causes problems on the system. And so if you're a kernel caretaker, or a uh, kernel developer, you may have to look into it. Uh, one example of something that can go wrong is a, that a task gets deferred too long. Um, while the work that is performed by soft IRQs and work queues can be put off and shouldn't be performed, for example, in interrupt context, it can't be put off forever. So RCU stands for read copy update. It's essentially the kernel's garbage collector that frees no longer used memory. Uh, you can guess that uh, while you could delay freeing unused memory, you can't delay it forever or actually you run out of memory. Strangely, another sign that work is uh, being delayed too long is when heavy network traffic makes the uh, system kind of fall over or freeze up. Uh, that may be because Network soft IRQs, for example, are delaying other soft IRQs, and much more about that in a moment. So uh, the kind of opposite problem of too long deferral of uh, work is that the executors of deferred work, like K-workers or K-soft IRQD, could run and run and run and run. And meanwhile, the user space applications whose uh, serving, serving the user space applications is the purpose of the system, and it doesn't get to run because these callbacks are running. And so you have to look into that. Oddly, another sign that uh, uh, deferred work is running too long is that the watchdog timer associated with K workers can fire, and that happens when uh, a K worker is sitting on a core and not yielding. And so, uh, if you work on systems that are very busy, you have to look into those kind of problems. And the real pain point uh, about soft IRQs and work queues is that they gather up a lot of different kinds of tasks <coughs> together. And it's often been hard to figure out exactly what they're doing. And it has been hard to figure out what to do about them when you have problems. So the purpose of this talk is really to open this window and give you some tools to investigate these um, work deferral mechanisms and to some extent do something about them. 
The first half of the talk is about uh, soft IR cues, which uh, remain difficult to control and difficult to understand. And the second half of the talk is about work cues, and that is uh, full of good news so that I'll give away the fact that the talk has a happy ending. But with that, let's dive right into soft IR cues. So what are the soft IR cues really? Well, there are 10, deli 10 delicious flavors. These are the order in which K soft IR QB will execute them. Uh, there are high and task lit soft IR cues, which are first in order. Then there are the network soft IR cues, which are, are kind of obvious. There are some associated with the block layer. For those who don't know, the block layer is what connects memory and file systems. There are some run by the scheduler. There are the rather obscure IRQ poll ones, which are used, as far as I know, only by network attached storage devices. There are two kinds of timer soft IRQs, and whoops. And there are some associated with uh, the read, copy, update uh, garbage collector. And so without knowing anything further about soft IRQs, you might say, huh, the network receipt soft IRQs are above the timers in this list and feel some foreboding. Uh, and so the fundamental design that we have a hard IRQ and then we have a soft IRQ that does the work that it is indicating needs to be done sounds like a, a good design, but there are problems. In fact, uh, soft IRQs just between us are not the most beloved feature of the kernel. Here are three money quotes from uh, well-known software developers. Uh, Frederick Weisbecker has said that soft IRQs are a pain to deal with. Uh, Thomas Gleichner, who's the dean of real-time Linux, has called uh, KSoft IRQD the big soft IRQ lock. And he has commented that uh, soft IRQs have heuristics which he finds disgusting. So I will brace yourself. I will now show you these disgusting soft, uh, soft IRQ heuristics. There are two limits which, uh, according to the uh, documentation, have been established by experimentation. They are shown right here. One is the uh, time slice uh, maximum that KSoft IRQD can use. And it's one is the maximum number of times that KSoft IRQD will run through that list of 10 soft IRQs. Um, these numbers are hard compiled into the kernel. And since you all know undoubtedly that the kernel runs everything from um, smart watches to sprinklers to supercomputers to Android phones, you might be wondering, huh, why are these numbers perfect for all those use cases? And the answer is, they're not, and no one knows, but no one has the nerve to change them. They've been at the kernel for a long time. Now, this situation is particularly painful because we continually have improvements to scheduling in the kernel. The ker uh, there's going to be a talk later on this afternoon about uh, some new improvements in scheduling in this very room uh, that I'm looking forward to. But the scheduler can't vary these numbers because they are they are compiled in. So this is not a great situation. But furthermore, let's, uh, that's not the really bad problem with soft IRQs. Let's talk about what the really bad problem is. So the uh, only one soft IRQ runs at any given time on a given core. And what that really means is it when a hard IRQ occurs, and as we say in the kernel, raises the associated soft IRQ, the runtime will check if a another soft IRQ is already running. So in other words, if this hard IRQ has preempted a, a running soft IRQ, then the soft IRQ will have called the function local bottom half disable, which is the, the villain in this part of the talk. So if no uh, soft IRQ is already running, then the happy path called the piggyback occurs, and the function do soft IRQ will invoke the soft IRQ that the hard IRQ indicates is needed. However, if a soft IRQ was already running, 
then it has taken this lock. It is called local bottom halves disable. You recall that software queues are also called um, bottom halves. And the software queue will have to wait for the K software QD thread to uh, execute it. So in other words, the software queue may occur actually in interrupt contexts without a, a context switch right after the hard error queue where it may occur sometime. And the reason I say sometime is the next time K software QD runs, it could run out that time slice and never get to this software queue. So the waiting may be for a while. Uh, so that is the big soft air Q lock that Gleisner is referring to. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, kind of briefly, about how you can tell what KSoft air QD is doing. So to do that, I have uh, two pieces of demo hardware here. One is this very laptop on which I'm uh, running a kernel that no sane person would run on a computer used for a presentation. And one is... Uh, an ARM64 8-core IMX8 board running kernel 6.1. And so the laptop is running kernel 6.7. And what I'm going to show you, I'm going to have to put down this mic for a second, and hopefully it won't make a loud crashing noise, is uh, a uh, function called uh, stack count that is part of the libbpfgcc tools suite. It's a package you can install on your system. And what stack count does is it prints out stack traces from the running kernel that end in a particular function. And so I showed you in the previous slide how do software queue function is actually the executor of uh, software queues. And so that's the function we're going to trace. And the, um, the demo is going to be run by stack count via a shell script. Uh, and I'm running all these demos via shell script just to minimize the amount that you actually have to watch me type, but the demo is live. And uh, what is going to happen is that, as with all BPF programs, the oops, lib LLVM is going to JIT compile some C code. It's going to uh, submit it to a validator in the kernel, which if the program is found to be valid, will load it into a virtual machine inside the kernel. And uh, it then it will s spit out these stack traces that end in the function, do software queue, and show you what paths of execution are leading to calls of software queue, do software queue. So if this is all sounds confusing, here are some warning messages. It's always nice in the morning. And now I'll run it on the 6.1 kernel on the ARM board. And so the libllvm is actually JIT compiling this code and inserting it in the kernel. And you can see the laptop is faster than the ARM board. Um, and so here are our stack traces. There were 6,200 uh, occurrences of this stack trace during that time period. Uh, and this stack trace refers to CPU idle. So I believe that it is a scheduler software queue, see if I can do this one-handed. Here's one that says uh, send message. So this is clearly a network uh, stack trace. There are 914 of these. And here's the, here's the result from ARM. Uh, there, here's another uh, uh, CPU idle. So this is another scheduler uh, software queue. Uh, all these functions with EL1, EL0, these are all uh, ARM assembly, and let's see. It would be great if I had a hand handless light, uh, but hands-free light, but whatever. Uh, so here's more 2CP stuff. Here's a PCIe uh, uh, function that is calling do software queue. You can see here's local bottom half enabled that is freeing the lock right, right before do software queue runs and so forth. So this is the best way I know to see what uh, KSoftWare QD is actually doing on a running system. <coughs> so uh, enough about that. Th this is the demo you've just seen. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about the big software queue lock and why it is a problem for real-time Linux. Uh, uh, so this shows why local bottom half disable 
the big soft tire key lock is, is a problem. Uh, and another title for this slide could be F trace output is hard to understand, but uh, let's work with it. This slide actually comes from Sebastian Sevier, who's one of the main developers of R2 Linux from a talk he gave at Linux Plumbers in the fall. Um, fundamentally, what we see here is that a network software queue NetRx is running. The SETA interrupt, which is higher priority, comes in and uh, would like to run the block software queue, but it can't run even though it's a, a re RT system and the highest priority grid should run because the network software queue has called local bottom half disable. So what actually happens is that the scheduler increases the priority of the network receipt software queue. It finally finishes, it may take a while, and then finally the block software queue gets to run. And so this problem with local bottom half disable and non-concurrency of software queues is, is probably one of the biggest. My goodness. All right. AV Follies, the facts are problems with uh, technology that we, uh, we in this room, in theory, at least can improve. So, uh, let's see, where am I now? So I wanted to show you a timeline of uh, the great labors over the years of attempts to improve software queues, starting with kernel 3.8. You could run the RCU, the uh, garbage collector, uh, callbacks in their own K thread and not inside K software QD. That means you could pin these threads to cores, you could increase their priority. Um, obviously, changing the priority of K software QD doesn't do you a lot of good because you're changing the priority of all those software queues together. Starting in kernel 512, you could run the network callbacks in their own thread uh, and move them out of K software QD. <coughs> there have been uh, two attempts uh, to move timers out of K-Software QD. If there's any callback you would like to be timely, presumably it would be a timer callback. Um, and there have been two more recent ones. Uh, one was a proposal by Frederick Weisbecker in kernel 6.5 to mark individual timers as uh, able to be run at the same time as other software queues. That ran into lock depth problems and didn't get very far. Uh, another one called uh, local lock nested that was presented in the CVR talk from plumbers that I just showed a snippet of. This was very clever. It actually uses scoped locks. The kernel has scoped locks now. So we could, in theory, remove all the go-tos uh, from the kernel, which would just be amazing. Um, this uh, was an attempt to move Get basically get rid of local bottom half disable and replace it with actual locks close to the data that local bottom half disable is protecting. So in good software engineering practice, we want to have locks right next to the critical data sections uh, that can't be touched by multiple threads at one time. But the problem is, is that local bottom half disable is scattered throughout the kernel. And then finally, uh, just merged in 6.9 this week, there is some work by Tejan Howell, the maintainer of uh, work queues and C groups in the kernel, to change tasklets uh, into users of the work queue API. So the, the tasklets are going to stay run by KSoftware QD, but their API is completely changing. Uh, tasklets had a a global use after free problem, uh, which if you don't know what that is, it's a big headache for security. And so uh, there's work underway to basically change all the tasklets over from using the existing API to work queues. And this change was Linus's own idea, so it's not amazing that it has merged. And I should say that Tejan Howell 
the uh, author of work cues, uh, the maintainer of work cues and C groups will be speaking in this very room later on this afternoon. And uh, so I, I'm looking forward to hearing that. So with that, we are, oops, good God, that was not what I wanted to happen. I think I clicked on a hyperlink. All the text on the, <laughs> all the text on these slides is, that is in blue is a hyperlink. There we go. So to summarize the uh, part of here about software queues, uh, there are about 250 call sites for local bottom half disable in the kernel. So getting rid of it is no small task. As uh, people have commented, nobody really knows what this lock is, is protecting. That was the same feature with the big kernel lock of old, which took years to, to remove. It is possible to run uh, RCU network and in the real-time kernel timer software queues in a separate thread, uh, which makes it more manageable and easier to observe. Uh, but if you do that, then you're incurring a context switch penalty every time that thread runs, and that may actually make your system performance worse. So for all these tunables that I'll be mentioning, um, as with any kernel configuration, you really have to run performance tests relevant to your workload to see if the changes will help. And as I said, it's uh, not so user visible, but a big improvement is coming to Caslet in kernel 6.9, whose merge window is still open because they will be changing to the work queue API and work queues are just an all around better design. Um, that we are done with software queues and uh, if, if anybody has any uh, questions uh, about software queues before we move on, I'll be, I'll be happy to answer them. There's no room to put the mic stand next to all the doodads I have on top of the podium. Uh, for your demo, what were you actually running in the script? You were tracing syscalls, but like, what were you actually running in order? What were you tracing? Let's go back and uh, we can just look at that real quickly again. As I said, all these, uh, all these are at GitHub. Yeah, tracing slide. I can do this left-handed. Uh, there we are. Here's just a slide that's uh, substituting for the um, for the live demo. So it's actually running this upstream tool, stack count. It prints out these stack counts along with the number of occurrences of that exact stack count. And so you can put any function you want here that's not running, you know, that, I don't know, there are very few functions you can't put here. Uh, and so you can trace any function you want using this uh, upstream tool. Yep. Just to confirm, the bottom half lock is on a per core? That is correct. So uh, two of instances of software queues, two block software queues could be running on two different cores. But on a given core, there is per core data that can't be corrupted by two threads. Uh, r r and so the, the, the crazy part is, is it really not possible to run um, block device software queues and uh, you know, scheduler software queues at the same time? What, what per CPU data could they have in common? And the answer, as I said, with 250 call sites of that function is no one actually knows. Uh, do you gain anything by uh, trying to lock your soft IR queues to a particular core? Right. So uh, soft IR queues are per uh, core threads. And so at boot, the kernel creates a K soft IR QD thread for each core. And that's fundamental to the kernel's design. So there's, yeah. And so a hard IR queue on a given core will raise the software queue on that core. So if you have a real-time Linux, you can pin the interrupts to different cores, but if I start talking about that, I'll never talk about work queues. So. 
Okay. Any other burning questions before we talk about work queues? Let's get to let's get to the good news part of the talk. So the hardest part about this presentation has been Okay, so the hard part about this presentation is that work queues have changed so much in the last 18 months that I've had trouble keeping up with it and preparing this talk. So let's talk about what work queues are. So here's a diagram to explain the fundamental idea of work queues. Um, unsurprisingly, we have lists of work functions, which are uh, pointers to the work that needs to be performed. Each one of these work queues will belong to a different kernel entity. So it might be that um, for, uh, some file system, for example, owns this work queue, and that file system driver is free to enqueue uh, all different work functions in the work queue. Uh, and a, but a different, uh, you know, a crypto driver would have its own work queue with its own work functions. Nonetheless. These two work queues may be associated with the same worker pool, which includes the key worker threads that actually perform the work on, on behalf of the drivers. And uh, once again, the uh, bound work queues that I'm talking about here are kernel per CPU threads. So at boot, on each core, the kernel starts a high priority worker pool and a default priority worker pool. And the key workers have uh, names like key worker, core number, and then just an, an instance. And w when you create a work queue, the work queue is associated with a worker, cool, a worker pool based on the flag that you set on it. Um, and so if you set a high priority on your work queue, then it will be assigned to the high priority worker pool. There's nothing, uh, nothing surprising about that. So let's talk about the names of key workers you see in the process table. Um, I sort of described already the bound key workers. There's a fixed number of pools, two per core. Uh, the kernel will spin up and spin down new key workers as they are needed. And these key workers are bound so they can't migrate. In contrast, we also have the mechanism of unbound key workers. Um, unbound key workers uh, can run on, on any core by default, that, but that is configurable, as I will note in a second. Um, there is a pool ID, which is just a number, as is the key worker ID. So every time you reboot, these, these numbers may be different. The unbound pools are for long-running, persistent work. Uh, they, some are created at uh, boot for um, system services, and some are dynamic related to uh, device drivers. These uh, uh, work uh, items can, can wander from core to core. There not only is not a fixed number of workers per pool, but there's not a fixed number of pools. And so once again, why might you care about all this stuff? Who cares about this work queues and key workers? And the answer is, if you are responsible for maintaining the kernel, you may be presented with a JIRA ticket, which has a splat uh, like this in it, where the uh, uh, work queue core informs us that some key worker has been running and not yielding for 207 seconds, which is a lot of computer time. And that uh, uh, antisocial key worker is associated with pool 112. And the splat will show you this is uh, real data from 515 kernel. Uh, there were three work queues associated with that pool at the time the crime was committed. Uh, one was the IXDBE network driver, one was some file system cleanup task, and one was a device driver whose name has been redacted. Um, you can see that this is, in fact, an unbound work queue because it could run on any of 56 cores. And the reason that these three work queues are in the same pool is because the uh, flags of each of them ends in the byte A, which is uh, an, 
some flags that describe the configuration of the work here. Now, if you have experience in maintaining uh, the kernel and dealing with threads that are conflicting, threads that are hugging cores, you might say, ha, huh, I'll either change the priority of the thing that's causing a problem or I'll pin it to a core away from the work that I really care about. And so you might use CHRT to change the scheduler policy. You could uh, use Renice to change the priority. Or you could use task set to set the core affinity of the uh, problematic thread. And all three of these methods won't work. Uh, so I'm going to show you this once again by coming over here to the hardware. Um, so the, th the thing you'd like to do is use task set to set the, uh, the CPU affinity of a thread. And I've written this program called classified process affinity. Oops. I do have to type the names of the programs, not the other guy. And we'll ask classified process affinity to read the affinities of tree workers. And so on this ARM uh, eight core board, or four core board, <laughs> here are these kernel per CPU uh, bound K workers at the top with the name K worker slash core number. Down here at the bottom, we have the unbound K workers. They're in a, a default priority and a high priority pool. Um, you can see uh, right away that K workers come and go because the numbering of these K workers in pool eight is not consecutive. There presumably used to be a U82 and uh, the wasn't being used, so the kernel got rid of it. Um, but the real point of this demo was we can see that all these K workers are unpinnable. And that seems really odd because I just told you that the unbound K workers can migrate. So if they can migrate, uh, why shouldn't they be able to be pinned? That seems to not make any sense. And the answer is going to be shown in a second here. I just want to just want to compare and contrast the um, situation with K workers on the newer uh, kernel 6.7. Uh, you can see now there are K workers called slash R, which uh, are rescue K workers uh, that reclaim memory when the system is getting low, so they prevent the system from ooming. And let's see, I'll go over to back to the slides. So the way the classif uh, classified process affinity works is it reads struct test flags from procfs. Um, what do I mean by test set and CHRT and renice manage the wrong thing? What I specifically mean is that what you really care about is your work, not K workers. You don't care about kernel threads that perform the work you need. What you really want is for this work to get done. And so the work queue API is requires a, a change of mindset. You actually configure properties onto the work queue, onto the work, and then the, the uh, work queue core provides key workers that match the attributes that you want. So task set and CHRT make, make uh, system calls into the kernel scheduler, and the kernel scheduler really doesn't manage work queues because it manages threads. You need to use the work queue API that manages work. And so I'm running out of time apparently, but I am going to show you uh, on x86, 6.7 here, a demo which should make this clear. Oops, unless I iconify the uh, window by accident. There we go. So this demo shows you how to illustrate the use of the okay
All right. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Now we're going to jet through this demo. So this demo is to show you how to manage work queues via the work queue API, not via the scheduler, and how you bind properties to the work queue, not to the key workers about which you don't care. So this demo won't work before kernel 6.6, .6, which is why we are looking at it on, uh, actually, let's start this over again. There we go. Okay, which is why we're looking at it on Intel. Uh, here we're looking at a listing of sys devices virtual work queue. There are uh, five work queues in there, one associated with block control groups, three associated with NVMe, and one associated with flushing of dirty pages back to the backend storage. And uh, you can kind of guess from seeing these all these storage devices, one uh, work queues exported to sys sysfs that uh, unlike software queues, where it is the network stack that tends to cause problems for other work, it is the block layer in, soft, in uh, work queues. And here are the tunables that are, uh, are settable via SysFS. The queue associated with uh, affinity of the work queue. Note it is affinity of the work and not the key worker again. Uh, one, uh, one associated with uh, concurrency, there's niceness that you know what it is. Um, I don't really have time to talk about it, but the uh, tr treatment of affinity in the kernel with work queues has really improved in recent kernels. The default affinity, affinity is per cache line. Uh, now it's, it, it used to be per NUMA node, so this is a big improvement once again in performance uh, by default. Uh, we can see that the default niceness is uh, is zero. Uh, I guess that may be off the bottom of the screen. Oh well, you have to take my word for it. Now we're using the Dragon debugger from Meta to run a, a script called workqueuedump.py, uh, and we're asking it about the NVMe delete work queue. We can see that uh, the NVMe delete work queue is uh, running in work pool 16 on all cores because it is unbound. And this demo is a little bit slow because it really is running in real time. Uh, and so now we're asking Dragon to query the kernel, what else is running in work pool 16 besides the NVMe delete work queue? And the answer is a whole bunch of stuff which is unrelated, related to Thunderbolt, related to graphics and so forth and so on. And uh, we're echoing four into SysFS to change the niceness. And we can see that uh, the NVMe delete work queue has changed to a different worker pool. And so, as I said, this is a, uh, I'm just going to skip the rest of this and go back to the slides so I can finish. Uh, and this is what I've just shown you is that you can configure work queues via SysFS and not via the functions that you're used to. And work queues have uh, just had one improvement after another in 6.5, 6.6. .6. Uh, there's also a new DPF DCC tool called work queue lat, which is not even part of the kernel source repository, which has just appeared. And so with that, I have told you that software queues run in, in interrupt context. They can be fast under the best uh, circumstances, but often they are slow and the opportunities for configuring them are, are low. Um, and people have been working on it very hard and progress is, the lack of progress is frustrating. Work queues run in process context. You manage the work queues, not the key workers about which you don't care. Their observability, configurability, and performance has improved greatly in recent kernels. I thank Sarah Newman for her suggestions about this talk. And there is a huge amount of further advice and resource information in these slides, uh, which are available at the SCALE website. So with that, I thank you for your attention. And I think I have time for probably about one, one question. But I'll be around uh, after the presentation if somebody wants to ask. I have which? Oh, I've got 20 minutes. Oh, man. Who wants to see about half dozen more demos?
Or actually, who has a question for us? Well, I'll just show you. Uh, so the when I, I changed the niceness of the source queue, it uh, changed the pool 18. So we were able to change the pool of the work queue by setting the niceness. And you might say, who cares? Well, if we ask um, Dragon now to query the kernel, uh, we can see that, in fact, the pool 18 has niceness minus 4. So the reason this NVMe delete work queue is in pool 18 now is, once again, its attributes match that pool. And what else runs in the new pool 18? Pool 16 had, like, 15 work queues associated with it. The answer is nothing. So NVMe delete work queue has its own uh, its own worker pool. So that's great, r right? That's that's wonderful. But actually, it might not be great. And I'll, I'll answer your question in just a second. The r the reason it might not be great is switching between work queues uh, when when a K worker is running doesn't require a context switch. Context switches are very expensive in, uh, in modern kernels. And so it could be by putting your, your work queue in its own pool all by itself that it got more latent. So there's always a trade-off in perf performance, CPU utilization, and latency. And there's no perfect solution, and it depends on your work queue, and you have to, you have to measure to find out uh, if you're making something better. So uh, let's, can we run the microphone over to the fellow that has a question? I, I, I can do it, whatever. And Tom, I think you left your sunglasses up here. Oh, okay. Uh, could you elaborate on what niceness means? Um, how exactly niceness changes uh, where the work is being moved? Right, so, I mean, if we would have changed the question is uh, how niceness affects where the work is being moved. So um, there, there was no worker pool with niceness minus 4 or 11 or something like that, right? Uh, so <coughs> the kernel will just create new work pools uh, if there is no work pool that matches a, a work queue. Um, well, 18 may already have been been there and just been idle for all I know. I'm not, I'm not actually sure. Um, the niceness then does just what you think it does. It increases or decreases the priority of the K workers. And so it's, it's a communication between the work queue API and the scheduler. But it's very odd because you're setting this niceness on a data structure, essentially, right? And, and uh, niceness is the priority of a thread. So the work queue API is really weird, but the more you think about it, the more it actually gives you the tools to do what you want. Because no one really cares about K threads at the end of the day. I'm not sure if I answered your, your question. So. Uh, Tom, yeah. Okay, so a threaded IRQ can be set affinity to a particular CPU. Correct. You can set that. This seems like now you've set a particular work queue to be able to also have affinity to a particular core. Is that correct? Right. It's one of the uh, it's one of those parameters. Right. So the the question is, you can set the affinity of a work queue to a particular core. Um, that is correct. Uh, if you set the the uh, niceness to zero, which is the default, or the niceness to tw uh, minus 20, which is the high priority one, and you set it to a particular core, it's going to run on one of the bound work queues. But it won't stay on the same core all the time. It will. Oh, it will. If okay. It, if, if it, you can uh, set the uh, affinity. Um, let's go back and look at that. Yeah, I, it's too small. I can't see it. But that's what Sorry, I, I'll I will make it larger. Thank you. So if we say list plus this devices virtual work queues, um, let's look at write back. Yeah, she'll get it for you. 
so here we have two parameters, affinity scope and affinity strict. Uh, affinity scope uh, can be per CPU, per cache line, per NUMA node, system-wide, or there's one called SMP, which has to do with paper threads on a, on a given core. And uh, cache is now the default, which is great. So unbound work will migrate only within the scope of a given cache line by default. Um, then there's this affinity strict, which is a parameter where you can express um, if my work can't run because its current affinity scope is so busy, do I want to allow it to migrate to a different uh, affinity scope? And uh, so um, you also can set this CPU mass. Um, something I haven't said is when we looked at um, the list of um, uh, unbound work queues associated with pool 16, there's like 15 of them, but there's only a few work queues in SysFS, and that's because we're only the work queues that are created with the flag WQ SysFS, I think, appear in SysFS. So I if a particular uh, work queue is giving you heartburn, one of the things you could do is to make a tiny kernel patch and just turn on that flag, and then it'll be there in SysFS, and you can uh, you can uh, change it. So with the, the um, by default, uh, any work queues that are created by drivers will just be run by the, the bound work queues. Uh, and there's another flag, WQ unbound, that assigns them to the, uh, to the unbound ones. Uh, question of, so a lot of this is stuff I haven't played with. Is there a particular book or blog series or video series you recommend to get more familiar with work queues and how mm. it all works? Yeah, so the question is, what are the best resources for uh, for work queues? I, um, this, as I said, I took some uh, stuff that I found out found uh, useful in here. There's some... Uh, also, some all these are uh, hyperlinks here. If you want to read about these features, I have to say that the documentation for work queues is uh, excellent. People like work queues. The uh, manual for software queues is still missing, unfortunately, because people hate software queues. They want to change them. They want to get rid of them, and no one wants to write about them. Uh, on this slide are three different tools for observing work queues. Uh, work queue monitor, which is kind of hop-like. There's work queue dump, which uh, dumps out a huge amount of information. I've been typing it through grep, and it's because it, it produces pages of output, and I'm only grepping out the one line that it, it's slow. Um, and then there's this um, BPF CC tools, new tool called work queue lat, which uh, prints out the amount of time elapsed between a work queue wanting to run and actually run in the spirit of the whole family of um, BPF CC tools that uh, report about latency. So you could learn a lot just by reading the kernel's entry documentation and using these tools once you get, get most of it. And as I said, all these dem I have a bunch more demos uh, that uh, I don't have time to show, and you could just you could download all of them and run them on your, si your system. So. All right, thank you, and uh, thanks for a great talk. Uh, hi, I hope this isn't too off topic, but in terms of other ways of dealing with real-timeness, do you have any notion of what the disadvantages might be of like on an ARM system using attached Cortex M cores to do your real time stuff? Is there are there disadvantages to that? Well, okay. So for those, the question is, are there adv advantages to using Cortex M cores, which may be part of ARM SOCs? ARM SOCs systems on chip tend to have uh, high performance cores and uh, lower performance cores, sometimes in pairs. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can assign some work to the Cortex-M lower capability cores. Um, certainly, uh, 
using the Cortex M cores to offload the kernel, uh, say from uh, handling network traffic um, or uh, you know just uh, kind of uh, any kind of uh, workload that tends to thrash the kernel by having a lot of interrupts, mm -hmm. you could possibly assign to the um, to the uh, Cortex M. Well, uh, the reason is to try and uh, make it more hard real time. You know, like right. if you're trying to um, run a PID loop, uh, running it on a time sharing CPU can give you uh, less than ideal results because uh, uh, PID loops uh, tend to assume that you're always measuring the system at a constant rate and uh, even with the, uh, the real-time Linux stuff, that's not really hard real-time, it's more soft real-time, right? Yeah, so Bill is talking about PID, he means uh, proportional integral derivative controller. Servo loops. Or tank circuit, as we used to call them. Yeah. And uh, could you run a control loop on a Cortex-M and show that something like that, that just is a very well-bounded uh, task which yeah. is perfect for a dumb device. Sure, yeah, and, and basically my question is, is there any downside to doing something like that? If it has to do a lot of communication with the other cores, then you incur a penalty, yeah. Yeah, okay. Are these two, are software queues and work queues interchangeable in a system such that you can disable one and your system will be fine? Or is the kernel in such a place where you have to keep them both enabled? There, so uh, the question is, can you do without um, software queues or work queues? They're ver both very integral to the uh, operation of the kernel. Uh, they appear, if you look at the kernel's um, main function in the, in the directory uh, init, there's actually a, a main function, a main dot tree with a main function in it, and it actually starts the work queues and software queues there because uh, the kernel really can't, it, even ignoring user space and the actual work we want done, it, it can't do without them. So they start really quite early after a, the system powers on. Um, you can you can uh, fiddle around with them a little bit, but you're kind of stuck with them. So. Um, you just have to deal with them. Yeah. Um, in your talk, in the description of your talk, you mentioned that uh, you also have been using DPF trays. I was just wondering what sort of information have you been trying to do through that? Yes. What, uh, what are your experiences with Right. So I've written a, thanks for the question. Um, I've also been playing a little bit with DPF trays to uh, uh, steer into the heart of uh, work queues and software queues. Software queues, what you can observe with them is really limited. And the reason is because they can run following the hard RSQ in atomic context, in interrupt context. And so I if you know what interrupt context is, you can't do printing from interrupt handlers or uh, you can't have trace points inside interrupt handlers. That's why the software queues are so inscrutable but because the work queues run in, um, in process context, you can have all these nice things. So let's run, uh, there's one here called work dot, so, oh, actually, I'm, yeah, yeah, let's run this one. So here's, uh, well, let's cut it, work dot. So here's, oh, I put some comments at the top, but, Here's here's the entire DPF trace uh, program. So it's uh, going to print out this little header, and then it's going to print a table. Uh, it's easier just to, dis but this is the whole this is the whole darn thing. So DPF trace is simple, and so all these functions tend to watch themselves. So if I don't grep out LDIS, it's just going to tell you that it's printing to this to this console, which isn't very in uh, interesting. And let's see, let's see. So 
once again, uh, C function is being hit compiled by Lobel VM. It's being inserted into the virtual machine in the live kernel. And here is some output. So here is the CPU mass of some different work queues which are running. Here's a memory management per CPU work queue. Here's a least recently used add drain per CPU for cleaning out the page cache. Here's a, uh, so uh, this uh, memory management work queue has been, uh, by dropping out eight, uh, we're looking at only at the bound ones. So it's running some memory statistics. Um, and then if we look at the, the unbound ones, we see lots of event work queues running. Here's some associated with the Intel graphics. Um, there's ordered and unordered work queues, which is yet another wrinkle. And here you can see the work they're performing, um, flushing, flushing the bump, the front buffer, so that's a blip for people who follow graphics and so forth and so on. Console callback and events are once again sort of observing itself here, but um, anyhow, the, it's easy to cook up these um, these BPF trace scripts, but Dragon and uh, uh, debugger and these uh, great Python tools in free in the kernel came along while I was writing this, and they're better, and they're maintained by Cajun Howe, who maintains work queues, so there's kind of no need to roll your own anymore, I would say. It's easy to do. Uh, so sorry, just to follow up. So would it be easy to, for, for instance, to see what was it actually getting scheduled in the team, what the pool that you were interested in, and then see like if there was something overriding what you were, um, the, the, the function you, or well the I queue that you were interested in scheduling? I, if, you, if you play around with these different tools, let's see. So you your work queue monitor. There we go, which is in the kernel. This is the top light tool. So what's it once again, this is running Dragon, and it's just running Cajun House Python here. And um, you'll it's by some combination of these tools, you really can you can really figure out everything. I have found. And you can always make a little BPF trace script to watch the work queue that you're really interested in. But uh, this this is now so easy compared to what it was when I started working on it proc. It's amazing. And also there's this automatic CPU intensive detection. Um, long story short, the flash that I showed you in the beginning, I think it might not happen now because the internal automatic detection of long-running work queues has improved, and these observability tools didn't exist in kernel 515 when I had to investigate this bug, a and so this problem is, is so much easier than it was 18 months ago, it's, it's, it's amazing. So this part of the talk is uh, all good news. So uh, um, are you aware of any tools that, uh, or any cases in the field actually where people actually migrate uh, to, to new work pools and uh, work groups, if you will, based on observed latency, sort of a, a scheduler that runs in user space that manages this stuff automatically, or is that something that's just not yet being done because it would kind of be counterproductive? Yeah, I think. I think this, a lot of this stuff is so new um, that people haven't really grokked it yet. And in some sense, even though keeping up with Kajun House and his coworkers' most recent developments is problematic for the preparation of this talk, um, it's also a sign that uh, it was a great opportunity because there probably haven't been that many presentations that talked about all these features so far. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I mean, like a lot of projects, my project isn't up to, to point nine yet, but when we get there, I think there are real opportunities to 
use all these observability and interpretability uh, features to make things uh, better or, of course, worse. I mean, if you just say, oh, I want all my, all my k-workers in separate pools and I'm, you know, m move everything out of k-sub L to b, you'll end up making a mess. What you really need is cast to characterize your workload and its performance and there's no substitute for doing a lot of work no matter how many tools you have. It gives you more rope to hang yourself with at the end of the day. So. Are we done? All right, thanks everybody very much.